So I don't know if you remember this, but back in 2018, the biggest debate around Xbox was Xbox has no games. Okay, they don't have enough developers and studios under their belt. They don't have the means to create the type of AAA games, quadruple A games that we see on PlayStation. Then Xbox started purchasing studios. And just in 2018, they bought Ninja Theory, Undead Labs, Compulsion Games, Playground Games, and then same year a bit later, Obsidian Entertainment as well. And I remember thinking myself once they announced all these purchases that it's going to take three, four years. And then we're going to get incredible announcements announcements of super triple a games on xbox because obviously the purchases didn't stop there right they then they bought zenimax and so on they just were on like a shopping spree they bought so many talented studios which by the way all have grown since then they've all gotten bigger but here we are in 2022 and where are those games where are the games like i'm not saying that xbox has no games that argument can't be made anymore but what i'm talking about are those super triple a these quadruple triple a games that we see on playstation god of war spider-man Uncharted, The Last of Us, those types of games. Where are those titles? I mean, we're just getting a new God of War game and you can literally taste the hype on platforms like Twitter where people are so excited. The game gets like tens out of tens everywhere. Everyone is excited to see what this game is all about. Where are those games? And some of you guys may say, well, you're just a PlayStation fan, but you're just hating on it. I don't even own a PlayStation. I also don't own an Xbox. I'm not on either side. I made plenty of PlayStation critical videos in the past. I'm just a little bit disappointed because I'm standing here like four years later after 2018 thinking, where, like, what are they doing? All these studios are big, they're growing. And don't even take this from me. Take this from Phil Spencer himself. Phil Spencer said in a statement that he understands why players are frustrated at the lack of major Xbox-only games, but noted that 2023 is said to be a big year with Starfield, Redfall, and Forza Motorsport 8. And if we look in the past, this seems to be a bit of a repeating pattern. Here's an article from 2018 where Phil Spencer says the lack of first-party Xbox One games are a weakness. Here's another article from 2019. Phil Spencer admits Microsoft's first-party output has been weak this generation. And here we are, 2022. And Phil Spencer says the same thing. So what's going on there? I mean, if you look at all these studios that Microsoft owns at this point, right, and you, you see what kind of games they have coming up, you have ZeniMax Media, Upcoming games Ghostwire, Tokyo, Redfall, and Starfield. Fair enough. But to be honest with you, as Phil Spencer mentioned in this tweet as well, he's like, 2023 is going to be amazing because Starfield, sure, it's a new Bethesda game and all that. People are kind of hyped for it. And it might turn out to be an incredible game. But from what I've seen, my expectation is not over the moon. Let's put it this way. Okay, It's not going to be like the next Skyrim. I don't know that. Obviously, I haven't played the game, but it feels to me like it's not going to tick that box. Okay, So it's a little bit concerning, is what I'm saying, that Microsoft is always tripling down on that. It's like 2023 is going to be amazing, mainly because Starfield. Starfield is our big ace that we still have up our sleeve. If you read social media and you look on Twitter and, and on Reddit and you kind of read the hype that people have for different games, by no means is the hype for Starfield, and from what I see at least, uh, comparable to a game like God of War, to a game like a new Spider-Man game on PlayStation. Same with Ghostwire Tokyo and Redfall. Not awful games. Don't get me wrong, they look fun, they look good, but it's not that quadruple A level thing that you cannot stop yourself but be like immensely hyped about. Activision Blizzard, okay, obviously Diablo 4, Overwatch 2 is already out. This is from, I think, January 2022. New Call of Duty game, sure. Rare has ever wild. I don't know. 343 Industries, they are in a lot of trouble anyway, okay? They're just like in the middle of a huge restructuring. I made a separate video about that. I'll link it down in the description. The Coalition, best known for franchise, Gears of War, currently unknown, probably working on a new Gears of War. Mojang, kind of unknown what they're working on, maybe some Minecraft thing. Ninja Theory, Senua Saga, Hellblade 2, and Project Mara. And this is, this is the perfect example, okay? Like Hellblade 2, again, looks good, right? It's fine it's a good game i do kind of want to play it and visually it's stunning but it's not on the level of a god of war game it's not on the level of like storytelling and so on of a naughty dog and look you might disagree with this this is an objective observation that i have i just play these games and i feel yeah it's not on par with those games playground games fable okay undead lab state of decay 3 sure fair enough compulsion games are not obsidian Avowed and The Outer Worlds 2, sure. In Exile Entertainment, kind of unknown. Maybe a new Wasteland game, we don't know. Double Fine, it's unknown what they're really working on. So do you see what I mean here? 
Like, like they have all this talent, all these studios. And like I said, they've all grown, right? These studios got bigger than they were before. And just looking at it on paper, it's really impressive, right? Look, look, 2017, they owned these studios. 2022, this is Microsoft now. It's huge. And maybe they just need a bit more time even more time to come up with games like the ones I'm kind of expecting from that level of talent. On top of all that, Microsoft has really doubled down on Game Pass. And that's another thing. When they announced Game Pass, I was like, holy smokes, man, that's going to change the game. This is going to be a huge thing. It's going to change the way how people consume games. I was super optimistic. It's a very pro-consumer decision that Microsoft made at the time. And I was sure this is going to be a big game changer for Microsoft. Well, they just announced that Game Pass missed its subscriber target for a second year in a row. On top of that, Phil Spencer announced that, or kind of hinted at, that there will be a price increase for Game Pass. Now, it is profitable, like uh, Tom Warren from The Verge uh, posted this. Phil Spencer confirms at WSJ Live that Xbox Game Pass is profitable for Microsoft. It's around 15% gaming revenue for Microsoft. And he says, I think it will stay at that 10, 15% of our overall revenue, but it is profitable for us. Phil Spencer also said that Xbox Game Pass on consoles has slowed down. We're seeing incredible growth on PC. On console, I've seen growth slow down, mainly because at some point you've reached everybody on console that wants to subscribe. And that just makes perfect sense, right? Because the install base on PC is just so much bigger. You have so many more machines and so much more potential to grow on that platform rather than on the Xbox itself. But Xbox did target a 73% growth rate for Game Pass of its fiscal year ending on June 30th this year, but the service only achieved 28% growth. So they were aiming for 73% growth and achieved 28. Now, let me get this very clear, like 73% growth is an insanely ambitious target, okay? I don't think anyone really believed that they would hit a target that high, but it's also a huge miss. And that combined with Phil Spencer kind of hinting now that the, the price will increase for Game Pass, he said, I do think at some point we'll have to raise the prices on certain things. But going into this holiday, we thought it was important to maintain the prices, Spencer said. We've held price on our console, we've held price on games and our subscription. I don't think we'll be able to do that forever. I do think at some point we'll have to raise some prices on certain things. Like just say Game Pass, Phil. Come on, man. Just say Game Pass is going to be more expensive. But you can see how this is not a great combination, right? You, you see they're missing these targets by quite a lot. And at the same time, he's announcing, reading between the lines, that the prices are going to go up. So we have to ask ourselves why that is. Why is that happening, right? Why are people not subscribing to the service? I mean, you get so many games, you get loads of exclusive titles on Xbox coming first to Game Pass. You pay a ridiculously amount of money every month and you're getting all those games, yet people are not subscribing. It's such a great idea. And Microsoft always tried to pitch it, I feel, as the kind of Netflix of gaming. And I think everyone read it this way. When it was first announced, it was like, okay, this is the end of actually buying and owning games, right? This is the beginning of the end of that. Now we're gonna have the subscription service and all the games are gonna be in there and you have all the games, you have this huge library that you can access at all times. And it kind of was supposed to do for gaming what iTunes did for the music industry, right? Like CDs and music was quite expensive and, and the, the industry was on a massive decline. People didn't buy it. And then Steve Jobs and Apple came along and they said, no, 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 guys, the trick here is Make it super, super cheap and accessible. So now you can buy single tracks for like $1 or $1.50 or whatever the, the entry prices were at the time. And that revolutionized the music industry, right? By making everything really cheap and affordable and accessible, suddenly people were selling music again and became more profitable. And the same applies for movies and the movie industry with like streaming platforms, right? That really changed the game. You made everything more affordable and widely available, but at the same time, people increased revenue. But the problem with that thought process is, in my mind at least, that people don't consume games like they consume TV or music. It's a, it's a very different behavior of an audience. You know, if you watch an episode of a TV show or you're watching a movie in the evening, it's a little bit like a snack. You start it, you finish it in the same evening or in like two, three evenings, you kind of binge the show or whatever, it's done. But a game, not all games, obviously, some games are just six hours and that's it, but most games are a commitment. You have to dedicate more time to it. You have to just show this game more dedication. And as a result of that, people don't want to dip into four different games per week. Obviously, there might be some people who like to do that, but I think on a grand scale, that's not how people consume games. I don't want to play four different games and, and play them for like two hours and then drop out of the game again and play something else the next evening and like every evening have a different game. 
it's just not how that works. It, the games also take more time to get into them until you're really understanding what the game is about. There, there's more complexity there, at least when compared to, I don't know, a movie or a TV show. And beyond that, I can observe this hesitation to subscribing to Game Pass on myself as well. Okay, for example, Scorn just came out. I'm curious about this game. I want to play this game. I could just literally spend one pound, get Game Pass for a month, like that's nothing, and I could play Scorn for free. I do want to play that game. And it's an incredible deal when compared to the 40 pounds that I would need to spend when purchasing that game at full price right now. But I'm not doing it. I'm not subscribing to Game Pass. And, and for me, personally, another reason beyond the ones I just listed is... It's another subscription service, okay? I have to share my credit card details. I, I need to actively cancel it. If I sign up now for this one month where I pay one pound, I think it goes up by a few pounds the next month. And I don't want that anymore. I just want to play Scorn. Now I have to remember, put myself a reminder, actively go into the Xbox interface, cancel my subscription, make sure that my credit card details are not saved. It's, it's not a huge hassle, don't get me wrong, but it is too much of a barrier for me. The commitment is too big to subscribe to the service, so I'm not doing it. There's also a little bit of subscription fatigue going on. I think five, six years ago, it wasn't that extreme. People were still more open. They were like, oh, Netflix is great. And oh, here's Disney Plus. I'm going to subscribe to this, all this content. Now people are like, dude, I'm looking at their bills every month, like subscribe to this and you pay all these monthly fees. So people are like, nah, I'm, I kind of had enough with subscription concepts and stuff. And it's harder for companies to get people to commit to these subscription type models even they might be a great deal, it's still harder to get people on board. It kind of forms a 360 degree circle, like coming back to the beginning of the video, that there are no epic Xbox exclusives that would get people to subscribe. If there would be like a God of War, a new Uncharted and the Spider-Man game and all this would be on, on Game Pass, I think people would subscribe, okay? At least it would motivate more people to say, wow, this, these are incredible games. You get them all for like this fairly small amount of money every month. I'm more willing to subscribe, but I feel generally over all these years that Xbox has owned all these studios, the trend has been that there are loads of mediocre games, okay? And, and I hate to say this because these people work so hard on these games and there are great games on that platform, also exclusives. I don't want to marginalize these games or make them look bad, but unfortunately the bar is up here. PlayStation is still setting the bar with those quadruple A exclusives. And unfortunately, there seems to be a little bit of an attitude of like just having more games on Game Pass rather than having less games that are really, really good games. And obviously, after all, all this is just a different strategy, right? You can say, well, Microsoft's strategy is just to sell you their platform with more games, quantity over quality, while Sony's strategy is slightly different, which is like we have less games, but the ones we do have are really top-notch quality, and these are just two different ways of approaching the game. And yeah, in a way, that is what it is, but with all this talent that Microsoft now has, it just leaves a little bit of a bitter taste in my mouth, because I feel they could release plenty of those, you know, borderline indie games that are really good, but that do kind of fall into the mediocre category that are just not AAA games, but at the same time have studios work on these monster, super hype AAA titles that everyone just wants to play, kind of like Sony does it. I feel they have so much talent, they kind of could tick both boxes, but they don't. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Leave your thoughts on this down in the comment section below. Do you think it's just a different strategy? Do you think Microsoft is struggling to manage all these studios to really make the most of all that talent? Like what is the big difference between how PlayStation approaches their AAA games and, and their studios and how Xbox and Microsoft does it? Like leave any of your thoughts on this whole topic down in the comment section below. I'm very curious to hear about it. I appreciate your time watching the video, hanging out with me. I hope you learned something. Maybe you enjoyed the video. If you did, you can smash the like button. It really helps the channel out. You can also subscribe. I would appreciate to see you in another video. Until then, take care of yourselves and I'm out. Bye.